second fight. Hey, well, community, welcome again. We have our uh, second Sunday message launching here on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, you name it. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. Uh, my name is Pastor Lundy, and I am the Young Adults Pastor here uh, for the Well at Emmanuel Faith Community Church. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Just as a reminder, in the description below, you're going to find a link to uh, what we're calling Sermon Notes. And that's going to be accessible through a Google Doc that we've made public to all of you guys. Uh, if you want to go ahead and click on that below, uh, you can either use the Sermon Notes during the message as you're listening in, or afterwards in reflection of what you've heard. And this is meant for either you as an individual or small groups, whichever you prefer and whatever you find helpful in this time. So we're filming here in my humble home and uh, we're grateful to be here even in the virtual way that we're still meeting. So uh, if you're joining us, we're in our series on 1 Peter and last week we took, the look, or we took a look at how Peter became nobody to somebody. He did this transformation uh, and we looked at it was primarily how he responded to the crises that God placed in his life that affected him and was shaped into becoming from a fisherman into an apostle. Uh, and today we're going to be continuing that journey in 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, and as you're turning there, if you have your Bibles, uh, I'd encourage you to read along in some way or tab to uh, some Bible.com or whatever it is that you use to follow along. We'd love to have you read with us as we hop through scripture together. But as you're turning there and as you're getting ready to join us, a couple things about our talk today. Uh, Peter is going to be talking about three things uh, that he is going to be exhorting his audience in this letter, and they apply to us as well. And isn't it just interesting, just as we kind of dive into this and do some reflection about the state of our society and perhaps even ourselves, isn't it interesting that it's only after we are on lockdown that all of us want to go to the beach, that all of us want to go on a hike, that all of us want to all of a sudden throw parties uh, because we know that we no longer have access uh, to those things. Our, our governor and our, our president have, have told us, you know, stay at home, observe the lockdown, and immediately the crowds are going to the beach, to uh, nature, you name it throwing parties. Uh, it's the same thing that happens that when you and I are sick, it's the only time that we actually appreciate what we had when we were healthy. The same is true when we, you know, if you left preschool behind and you, you reflect on, man, how great it was to actually have a nap time scheduled in uh, to your day. I know that I personally would prefer having that scheduled back in. But the thing is, is we as human beings, what we are prone to do is we long for the things that are suddenly taken from us. It's only in the bad times that we reflect on what we had during the good times. Because bad times tell us and they show us the things that the blessings that God has placed in our lives. And it gives us a renewed appreciation for those things. But even beyond that. The bad times potentially have an ability to focus our perspective on what's most important. That's one of the things that we're going to find today. Peter is writing to an audience and a community of churches that are facing dark times of persecution. And in facing those dark times of persecution, Peter is exhorting them not to waste this opportunity. Because this opportunity is actually tremendously significant, not only for them individually as believers, but also collectively for the entire Christian movement and for the gospel. And so diving in, 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to be back up in verse 1, uh, talking about what Peter is exhorting. Again, three things that Peter is trying to get across to his audience. The first that we're going to find is that Peter reminds these churches who they are. They are God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now pause there. When Peter is saying elect exiles, he's actually calling on a distinctly Jewish idea. You see, if you're familiar with Israel's history, they had been conquered by the Babylonian Empire and from that conquering, they have been scattered throughout the ancient Near East. And for 70 years, the Jews were 
in Babylon, waiting for the day in which the Lord would return and, and bring them back to the promised land. But what's so funny about what happened in the exile to Babylon is that the majority of Jews actually stayed in Babylon. There was only a, a small segment of the population that returned back to Canaan and resettled and rebuilt and, and made a new kingdom for themselves. The majority of the Jews actually stayed in Babylon. And beyond that, some of them actually moved to Egypt and some of them moved to Turkey and they kind of spread out throughout the entire known world at the time. By the time that Peter is writing this letter, in the New Testament days, the Jews had also done the same thing throughout the entire Roman Empire. The Jews were a scattered people. And in scattering, they began to develop this idea of what was known as the dispersion. And that was God's people spread out through the entire world. And even despite this spreading out, the Jews understood that they were still bought into the covenant that God had given them as a people despite the fact that they were small, marginalized, and divided. Fast forward to the time that Peter is writing this letter, and Peter exhorts the churches in the same way. In spite of the fact that you're exiles, you're marginalized, you're alone, you are nonetheless still chosen by God. You are still chosen by God. You might be on the margins, but you're chosen. <laughs> you might be alone, but you're chosen. You might be uh, ashamed and, and downtrodden about who you are as a, as a member of God's people, but you are still His. This is not something that can be taken away from you. You know, if you've ever been a part of a, a sports team and you're growing up and there are two captains choosing teams, it's, you, you've been chosen by the, the star athlete. No matter about whether or not someone actually wanted you on the team, the star captain has decided to pick you and to have you come on his team. We serve a God that chooses his people, chooses his people, and he chooses these elect exiles. He says, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, what's so crazy about this is Peter is writing to five different provinces. It's a wide area of land that he's addressing. These are churches that regardless of how far out, how divided and 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 geographically separated they are from one another, yet they still have the unity of being chosen by God. These elect exiles. But even beyond being chosen, verse 2, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The God who knew everything has now chosen you. You know, this coronavirus crisis that we're in, it was unknown to man that this would happen, but it was known to God. And God is already doing things in your midst, in your life, in our community, and in my life that otherwise would not have happened if this coronavirus had not happened. God works through all things for the good of those who love him. All things, including what's going on now. Because our God the Father has chosen us and everyone in his family according to what he knows and he knows everything. He has seen everything. But even beyond just being chosen, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So the Father has chosen us. The Spirit is sanctifying us. It's as if that star athlete captain has chosen you. And then beyond that has put on your jersey to play the game in your stead. But you get the credit. You know, so many of us are, are uh, we think of the Christian life as this difficult, uh, strenuous thing. But the reality is, is God is doing the work through you. If you allow him to, the sanctifying work of the Spirit. This is not something that you and I can do apart from him. In fact, God has to be the one to do it through you. It's one of the most important reasons why a consistent prayer life of maintaining and deepening that relationship with your God and your Lord is so significant because without that, you're going to continue to default in your own strength. The sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient. To be obedient. The Spirit makes you obedient to Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus set the standard high. I mean, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. You know, if, if you have a, if you see a, a log in your neighbor's eye and yet 
you ha you you are a splinter in, in your neighbor's eye, and yet you cannot see the log in your own eye. Repent of your own wrongdoing before pointing out somebody else's. Jesus set the standard high, and so many of us strive to be obedient to him. And yet, and yet, that's not the point. The point is that the Spirit is the one that makes you and me obedient if we allow him to work. And all of this is possible by what he says, and sprinkled with his blood. The single act of Jesus' crucifixion on the cross has allowed you this relationship with God, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son that allows you to tap into the power of God in your life for God's glory. All of this, Peter summarizes, what is it that you and I have gained? Peter is Peter is 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 telling us who we are in this section. That's what he is doing. That's the first thing that he's doing. Peter is telling us who we are. And the result of that is as he says at the end of verse 2, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Abundance. Not in scarcity, not in sufficiency, in abundance. Grace and peace. You know, grace is such a, 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 a game changer. And the fact that you and I have it in abundance is just mind-blowing. And the peace that we have now in Christ is ours as well. Not, not in scarcity, but in abundance. You see, what the New Testament writers, this is key. So this is the first thing that the New Testament writers will do. Before the New Testament writers tell you how you ought to live, they always remind you who you are. They always remind you who you are. The New Testament writers are concerned with how you're living your life, but they're mostly concerned that you know who you are. You know, and so many of us in the Christian life get that backwards where we operate from a, well, if you're the real deal... It's because this is the way the world is. If you're the real deal, then you're going to act and do and behave a certain way. Notice how significant that distinction is. You are trying to prove who you are based on what you do, rather than just simply acting from a secure sense of who you are and living in a different way. It's a very key distinction because if you do not act from who you are, you're always going to try to be proving to somebody that you, you're worth it. That you're the real deal. Rather than acting from a place of love and security, you're going to be working for that love and security. And you're going to be a slave to people's perceptions, your own self-perception, and the perception that you think God has of you. But what Peter is reminding us is the reality of how God sees us. The reality of how God sees us, we are sons and daughters chosen by a God that knows everything, who is sanctifying us to be obedient to the perfect standards of righteousness he's called us to. But we make no mistake, this is not from us. This is our dependency, from our, all of us is from our dependency upon him who gives us the strength. That's the first thing that Peter tells us. He tells us who we are. Are. The reason why that's significant, as we'll see later, is further down in this passage, still in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And he says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice again, he's still reminding us who we are. The actions of God have given us a new identity and we are inheritors in verse 4. An inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. You and I are inheritors of everything Jesus has done. All the consequences of your actions he has taken upon himself in the reward of his perfect life you have also gained. You have given him the consequences of your actions, and he has given you the consequences of his perfection. Everything, everything wrong you've ever done, the consequences are ultimately not going to catch up to you. Ultimately not. You might taste a couple of, 
uh, slaps on the wrist through life, but ultimately you will, you and I will never get what we deserve ever, no matter what you've done. Instead, you're going to get everything, the entire reward of what he, Jesus has given you, you and I are inheritors of this thing, meaning that we did not come up with it on our own. We did not build this wealth, if you will, on our own. You know, if you're a trust fund baby, right? You're you're so, you're you're someone who has a wealthy parent who has achieved success in business or or whatever, who has received a tremendous amount of wealth, and only on the basis of the fact that you're their kid, you're gonna get all the money. Paul is telling us that's exactly true of us except in a far more significant way, not in an earthly way, excuse me, Peter is telling us, not in an earthly way, because he says, this inheritance can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. This is an inheritance that is ready for us, that is prepared for us, and is kept secure for us beyond our present circumstances. Who through faith, in verse 5, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice, the inheritance is kept for us, and you and I are also kept. The inheritance is kept safe, and we're kept safe. All by the power of God. That God is making us secure in our salvation by His power through our faith in taking a hold of His promises being strengthened in our inner being, as Paul says in Ephesians, to take hold of the reality of God's love for us and what it is he has promised us is that these things, this inheritance is accessible through our faith. But again, this is not dependent on you and me. All this requires is trust. And we're still only in the first point here. Until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So Peter is telling us, hey, you know, you are currently experiencing dark times. And in the midst of that, let me remind you who you are. Let me remind you who you are. This is not something that you're just going to tough through and just try to get through. Rather, you're going to thrive in this season because you have the right perspective. And so much of it rests on who you are. So much of it rests on who you are. Your, your sense of self-perception. Peter is reminding us once again who we are. And the reason for this is very clear as he moves on to verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have yet had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Again, the context that Peter is writing to are to various sets of churches throughout Turkey who are undergoing terrible persecution. And by persecution, I mean, we're talking about gnarly stuff here. And what's one, what's interesting is, is that some historical work has been done in terms of the kinds of things that were done to Christians during the Roman world. And these are things like being tarred and feathered and lit on fire. These are things like being crucified right side up or upside down in Peter's case. These are things like being thrown into the uh, Colosseum and being either hacked to pieces by gladiators or, or eaten alive by wild animals. I mean, the kinds of things that were being done to Christians, not, in, not, not even to mention the fact that a lot of Christian business owners were excluded from the marketplace and their, their sense of livelihood was totally jeopardized by the Roman uh, authorities and the temple authorities and the fact that the Jews would continue to bring the Christians before Roman governors and try to slander them and to frame them for crimes. I mean, the kinds of persecutions that are going on in this context by our standards are rather severe. Rather severe. And yet what Peter is here saying is that even regardless of that, regardless of all that, now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. He's not minimizing the pain. That's very significant. He's not minimizing the pain. Rather, what he's doing is he's just putting that pain in perspective. He's putting that pain in perspective. The second thing that Peter 
is exhorting this crowd, this audience, is that after knowing who you are, after knowing who you are, you and I ought to how you and I ought to respond to dark times in the way that he is laying out here. He's not minimizing the pain. He's just simply putting that pain in perspective. And that perspective, he says in verse 7, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold. So faith is more valuable than gold. Why? Because remember, we're inheritors of a treasure that we cannot yet access right now. That is imperishable, that cannot spoil, nor can it fade. Of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire. Now, notice, you and I, right? We, we might crush it in this life. We might make six figures. We might uh, become the star. Uh, you name it. Whatever it might be, you and I are always going to leave this life totally naked. Totally, totally without anything that we've brought in with us to life. We, leave the, we enter this life naked and we leave it naked. We can take nothing with us. Everything that we've accumulated and collected and achieved with our lives, all of it fades by the time that we finally kick the bucket. And what's crazy is that you and I are, are so, uh, we're so uh, anemic to that perspective. Are, we live in such a death-defying culture. And so we chase after this and after that. And we think that this is going to provide us meaning. And this is going to be the thing that we're longing for and missing. And yet Peter is telling us again, no. The faith that you have is of greater worth than gold. The thing that was sought after as the standard for, for the entire economic system in the Roman Empire. This faith is more valuable than gold. Because this treasure that we have does not fade. It does not fade. And beyond that, he says, there's these trials, ending off in verse 7, the, the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Again, he's putting the pain in perspective. First, he's showing us who we are, and then he's putting the pain that we're experiencing in perspective. And he says, how you respond to these times is very significant, not only for yourself as a follower of Christ, but ultimately for his glory and his praise and his honor. Jesus is very interested in how you and I respond to this coronavirus crisis. He's very interested in that. Are we going to languish in old habits and aimlessness and entertainment? Are we going to give in to fear, distress, anxiety, frustration, anger? Are we going to allow the worst parts of ourselves to come out? In the midst of family issues that we can't escape anymore because we're stuck with these people? Are we going to allow that to happen? Because let me tell you, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. You and I can roll out of bed and all of a sudden just decide to be the worst human beings ever. It's the easiest thing. Easiest thing. For us to give in to the worst parts of our nature. By default, we always go there. We always do. It is a hard thing to rise up in the morning and say, you know what? I'm going to lean into this thing. I'm going to be a champion. That's what Paul says. In all things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. In all things. But you and I don't have that perspective. We forget who we are. And then when the hard times come, we don't know how to respond. And so we've run into escapism or we lash out or we just simply get depressed and we go aimless and we don't have intention or focus or drive or direction, anything. We just simply allow the situation to overwhelm us. And Peter is saying, no, don't do that. These times of suffering and anguish and disappointment for a little while are doing something very significant, not only for the genuineness of your own faith, but also for the testimony of who our Lord is, of who our God is. It's 
all very significant. He continues. Ultimately, we know who we are. And we know how then that this is a significant season. We know who we are and we know that he wants us to respond to dark times in a certain way. Who we are and how we respond to dark times. The third thing that he shows us here is why. Why? Why can we respond to the dark times in this way? And we've been teasing it out as this message has been going on. Verse 8, though you have not seen him talking about Jesus, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Just pause there. The Christian life is meant to be full of joy, glorious joy. And for so many of us, whether we have experience with faith or not, we think in the exact opposite terms. We're burdened by the dark times. We're burdened by the pain. We're burdened by the persecution. And the burden and the weight of that weighs heavily on us. And we lose perspective of the fact that ultimately all of this is just simply taken care of. Remember earlier in our passage, our inheritance is kept safe and we are kept safe. Our God who has foreknown everything has chosen us and he is the one working through us. By the power of the one event that gave him the authority to do so. The cross. You see, for so many of us, we approach the Christian life from a perspective of I have to do rather than it has already been done. And on the basis of that it has been done, it is finished, that is the result. That results in tremendous joy. Joy every single day if we tap into it. If we do not forget who we are. And if we approach to the dark, if our, if our approach is to the dark times in light of who we are, then that glorious joy is ours because we're untouchable. Every tragedy, every opportunity for, for uh, death, everything, every uh, bad thing that happens to you and to me is just another doorway into his grace. Is just another reminder of his sovereignty. Is just an opportun another opportunity for God to raise you from death to life again. Whether now in this life in a figurative sense or ultimately at the end of your life. Literally. Everything. Everything. Leads back to him. I am drawing all things to myself. Jesus says. Behold I make all things new. And he does it by the authority of what he has accomplished for you and for me. Verse, verse 9. This is the result. You are receiving the end result of your faith. The salvation of your souls. You see, the joy that you and I have enables us to approach every single dark thing that we experience from a posture that capitalizes on it. And in, in, in all of this is in light of who we are. These are the three things that Peter is laying out. Who we are, how to respond in dark times, and how we do it, or, or, and why we do it. We do it because of this eternal perspective. You are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter says, do not lose sight of the fact that all of this is tremendously significant, and all of this has so much purpose. Your sufferings, as Paul says in Corinthians, are achieving for us a weight of unsurpassable glory. This, the, the sufferings that you and I experience, let me just pull up that passage, actually, rather than just simply quoting it. 2 Corinthians chapter 
4, verse 16. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. In this, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Therefore, he says, we do not, or so we fix our eyes on what is, it, uh, what is seen, but on what is unseen. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Is eternal. You see, everything that you see, even in this room, myself, everything, given modern life expectancies, are going to be gone within a hundred years. The number of people that are going to remember me will be my family, hopefully. And a couple of close friends and and people, and yet that's likely it. Everything fades. Vanishes rather quickly. And maybe you're in that season where life just seems to be passing you by, and the things that you once held onto dearly for security and stability are all of a sudden taken away from you. This is an opportunity for you and for me to look and to fix our eyes to the eternal truth. That we have been saved, chosen, that everything is working to the good of us, that we ourselves are being perfected, and that through the work that God is doing in our lives, being made to be obedient to our rightful king, and that through this we are experiencing tremendous joy. I mean, it's easy to find, it's easy to lose focus on all these good things that that God has done for us if we don't have the rhythm and the focus to remind ourselves who we are. How to respond to dark times and why that is. And again, the why is the fact that we have a glorious salvation that we get to tap into every single day. And that looks like joy. That looks like joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength, says the psalmist. I will tread on the heights All these things are accessible and and are ours in Jesus Christ. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 says this. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. How you and I respond in these days are so significant for what it is Jesus is trying to do in and through you and me. And yet all of this is good intentioned and maybe even inspiring in some way. And yet still you and I lack the power to be able to do this on our own. You and I cannot approach life from the way that we ought to apart from Jesus. And ultimately the the, the final thing I simply want to say in light of what Peter is telling us. In light of what Peter Peter is telling us, ultimately the way in which you and I achieve this is we keep it personal with Jesus of Nazareth. Peter says, you do not see him, and yet you love him. You do not see him, yet you believe in him. And the way that you and I do that is by becoming familiar with who he is. You and I have to be personal with our Savior. You know, not only should we be reading this thing with more Uh, consistency than perhaps uh, we are, but also placing ourselves into the words of Scripture, placing ourselves into the scenes of the gospel, and asking ourselves, how would I respond if I were in this scene with Jesus? Man, I'd encourage you to do that. I'd encourage you to do that in light of this time that we have to sit down, and whether on a daily basis or, or a rhythm that you decide... Find yourself in the scenes of Scripture and be personal with your Savior. Because ultimately, He is the one who blazed this trail for you and for me. The author of Hebrews, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. If you do not have your eyes fixed on Jesus, you and I cannot hope to do this. In John chapter 12, and we'll close with this. John chapter 12. Verse 20, this is towards the end of Jesus' ministry. 
and he is uh, he knows that his time is approaching. And in verse chapter 12, verse 20, it says this. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. These are likely Jewish uh, men and women from Greece or from Egypt, either one. They were both Greek, uh, Greek cultures at the time. These Jews came and they came to Philip in verse 21, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Notice how this man's fame is spreading even within just a, a couple of years. Philip went to tell Andrew and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, he knows that the people are looking for him and that these now these Greeks have asked him and he says this, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. And what he meant by that was his death on the cross. Very truly, I tell you, in verse 24, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me, this is it. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. You see, our God wants to do this with you. He wants to do this with you. He does not want you to do it alone. In fact, he wants to invite you on a journey of being reminded of who you are, of approaching the dark times from his posture and by being equipped with your eternal perspective. The glorious joy that comes from that. But ultimately, the only way you and I can do this is if we do it with Jesus. You and I will find ourselves According to this passage, you and I will find ourselves in tremendously shameful, dirty, unlikable, painful situations in life. Because ultimately, that's where Jesus went. Jesus went and died on the cross. And Jesus finds himself in the most unlikely of places. Because that's where his father sends him. You and I are also sent to those same places. And often in life, we sit here and we wonder what in the world God is doing. And yet what he is doing is he is doing this with you. And he's inviting you into the honor that he wants to give you. These sufferings are achieving for us a weight of glory that nothing, nothing can compare to. And so regardless of whether or not this is something that is new to you or whether this is something that is uh, old for you, regardless of what it might be, uh, we just want to take the time and encourage you to not forget who you are and to take an opportunity, take advantage of this time in this coronavirus to lean into what the Lord is doing. And for all of us, that might be the most painful things that we find ourselves in. Our families, we don't like. We want to be out with our people, with our, our community. We want to go do stuff with life. We want to go and seize the day. And yet we find ourselves all of a sudden sitting on our butts 24-7. Man, lean into the, what the Lord is doing. Because he will lead you to the most unlikely places to experience his sovereignty, his honor, his power. Let me pray for you. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to be a part of an online community that is uh, continuously uh, uh, supporting and encouraging one another, uh, we'd encourage you to sign up for our online groups. They're in the description below on YouTube, on Instagram there, on the link in the bio. If you'd like to have a community that, that supports and encourages you in here, we just would love to have you join us. Go ahead and click that link and sign up, and uh, we'll be placing you in a group and uh, sending you a bit of a, a welcome. But for all of us, this is an opportunity again to receive from our Lord the perspective that he would give us and all the things that he seeks to, to give us in the midst of this dark season. So let me pray for us as we, as we end this message together. 
Lord, we are so easily distracted. We're so easily deceived. We're so easily discouraged. And yet, Lord, you continue to draw our eyes back to you. We want to keep it personal with you, Jesus. We want you to be the one to show us how we ought to approach this season. We want to see from you how you would uh, live in our midst, in our families, in our communities in this time. Lord, we want to lean into the challenges that you have for us. And yet we can so easily miss the opportunities that are placed right in front of us. And so God, would you please be uh, with us? Would you please show us the way? Would you bless every single person watching this with the grace and peace in abundance that is ours? If we just take the time to receive it. God, we thank you for our time together. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part. We'll see you next time.